to connect our customers to the opportunities of today. We want to connect our customers to the opportunities of today. We also lead the next generation connectivity. And, of course, we also like to experiment and we see ourselves as the innovation lab for customer experience. So, starting with my first points, we connect our customers to the opportunities of today, really. And now I'll move over here to the first thing, a drone. This is a drone. By the year 2020, one million drones will fly over Germany. And needless to say that it increases some danger of collisions. Actually, last year alone, we had 60 interferences with the German air traffic. I have also two drones at home, which are smaller, so we love drones, I have to say. And in order to make the traffic safer, Deutsche Telekom and Deutsche Flugsicherung, so the German air traffic control, are jointly developing an air traffic management system. So, this goes like this here. This device here is a SIM card and an LTE sender, and you attach it, as you can see here, to the drone. And as a result, you can actually precisely the detect the drone everywhere, and you can also operate drones out of sight via our mobile network. Um, we have been working with the German air traffic control now for the last 18 months on that, and the first pre-commercial test flight was last summer when we had seven drones flying um, at the same time. But we are not also working with the German air traffic control, we are also doing very practical stuff, for instance, with the fire department in Dortmund. In Dortmund, we are actually using a drone to fly ahead of a rescuer. And we are also using drones with the Deutsche Lebensrettungsgesellschaft, so life-saving society, and we use actually drones to detect missing people. And it's needless to say that going forward, Drones being operated out of sight will be very important also to replace helicopters when it comes to aerial inspections. But we are not only connecting drones. Next item, connected machines. Last year, we announced to roll out narrowband IoT technology in eight countries. And I'm happy to say, also looking at our international guests, that we did it. We have now narrowband IoT available in eight countries, in Germany and in Holland, in Greece and in Hungary, in Austria, in Poland, in Czech Republic and in Slovakia, and also in Croatia, it will be available until end of this year. We have now 200 business customers using our connected machines or connecting things products and 18 smart city projects across 10 European countries. Now let me actually highlight my pet topics here at the booth and please take a look. They have to do with predictive maintenance für alle Heimwerker. So, first thing is ToolSense. Uh, ToolSense makes power tools, screwdrivers, jackhammers, smarter, by leveraging usage-generated data. For example, data which show you um, under which usage conditions a jackhammer breaks. Also, wenn man die Bohrmaschine völlig falsch bedient hat, zum Beispiel. Yeah? So, power tools um, are based on usage-generated data, and the data help to improve things like energy consumption, longevity, or also stuff like tear and wear, so Verschleiß. So and, uh, that's for this. But it's not only about tool sense. I would also like to show to you another thing here. 
Maybe you can have a look. That is a sensor. That sensor gets built, for instance, into the cement of a bridge. And it can measure things like humidity or corrosion or crack. And then it sends those information to a sensor which is on top of the bridge. And that sensor sends it via narrowband IoT technology to a central platform. And that actually helps to analyze from remote if there is a potential damage. So the obvious advantage is you don't have to send people to look at the bridge. But even more important, you can detect, because the sensor is in the bridge, damages before the real physical damage becomes visible. Actually, in Germany, this is a huge topic and I guess in our European countries as well. Um, when you think about the status of some of our streets and um, railways, etc., cetera, um, I heard that, for instance, in Brandenburg alone, every tenth bridge can no longer be repaired economically. Yeah? And these sensors and NB-IoT solutions help to predict maintenance yeah, and um, be ahead of time. I have to say that on this one, we are actually working with a company called BS2 uh, Sicherheitssysteme. That's the company on which we are working on this. So, but we are not only connecting machines and drones and vehicles, we are also connecting citizens. So we have actually a new product which is available now. Here, it's big. It's actually a city pass based on blockchain technology. What is that? That is a solution for mayors of cities because it offers, the solution offers a white label solution which gives cities the possibility to offer digital services to their citizens. For example, renting a bike, or renting a book in a library, or public transportation. And for that city pass, we actually use blockchain. So for us, blockchain is not only a super financial Bitcoin hype, yeah, but the real stuff we are using, blockchain technology, to make the transaction between the platform yeah, and the paid service safe for the citizens. It's available now, we have that product. So I would say, we, and we are in discussions with cities, for all mayors who listen to me, we would like to engage with you into a discussion about the city pass. So, coming to the next scheme. We need, of course, the next generation connectivity. And I do not need to emphasize that we have the best networks. You can see that in the network test we did win, because I believe it's not about winning network tests, but about the best customer experience we deliver as well. And we are very, very proud of this. And even though we are at the Mobile World Congress, I would want to emphasize one topic which is so important to us. And I see here, Tim, you say you love networks and you love to invest into networks. And as a CTO, I love to have a CEO who loves to invest into networks. Clear, yeah? So, but uh, let me share with you that right now, we are in the middle of the largest network modernization in our history. The largest network modernization in our history. N number one. In our European countries, including Germany, we continue to lead the digitization of our networks, what we said, IP transformation. That's nothing new. We talked about it before, but it's always super nice to say we deliver. Number two, in many of our European countries and in Germany, we make our mobile antennas 5G ready. Yeah, we modernize our antennas. For the techies here, it's the SRAN modernization we are doing, actually on the latest technology. And for that, I have a specific remark with regard to Germany. 
In Germany, we have the advantageous position that we have so-called 15 megahertz on the 900 mhz band. Practically, that means that we are able to provide deep LTE coverage into the houses, into the cafes, and into your favorite pub. Actually, my head of technology for Germany, Walter Golden, it says it now works also in his Irish pub in Bonn in the basement deep in the corner. Yeah, so this is what it does. Good spectrum position provides deep in pub, in cafe, uh, cafe and cafe, yeah, and in-house coverage. And as the title says, fiber. Fiber across our European footprint. In Germany last year, we built 40,000 kilometers of fiber. 40,000 kilometers of fiber is more fiber than the entire network of the federal streets, Bundesstraßen. And we have now 455,000 kilometers of fiber, which is 10 times as much as the network of the federal streets. And we will add 60,000 kilometers this year. So really about fiber. And when talking about our network modernization, I like to give one example. And this is the example of Germany, but in some other countries, it's not so different. 75% of the cable line construction capacity in Germany, 75% works only for Deutsche Telekom. Sometimes I have the impression I'm not the CTO, but the chief construction. Bauunternehmer, yeah, person of this company. But 75% of the cable line construction capacity is working for us to make sure that we get the best networks of the future and that we are not talking, but we are delivering. And I don't need to mention to you that fiber is also very important in the context of 5G. Now, 5G is again the topic here. Yeah, and at the Mobile World Congress, we operators are always proud to announce and show new world premieres. And by the way, I will actually come to that. And 5G will be so important because it increases the capacity by the factors 1,000, the speed to 10, and it reduces the reaction time by the factor 10. Now, I have realized prior to this Congress that also in the media, well, there was a lot of debate about what do we need 5G for? Are we really pretty sure what we want to do with this? So let me share with you what we think about it. Actually, we believe we need it for three application areas. Number one, we believe 5G can be a complementary access technology, complementary to fixed line access technology, as it can deliver very fast gigabit speed, also for people who do not want their gardens to be digged up on new in-house cabling. Yeah, so gigabit speed to the homes. We call that fixed wireless access. Number two, we actually believe that the most relevant business cases in 5G will start around the B2B area. And we are not only talking about connected drones or connected cars. We believe that 5G has also a big contribution to play to the energy sector and more on midterm horizon to disrupt the healthcare sector. So new business cases in B2B and I will show you one. And last but not least, it's also about the capacity. We observe in our networks that the traffic is growing up by 45% per annum. So the traffic goes up, and in order to meet that capacity demand, 5G on the midterm time horizon is the much better alternative to 4G because it's more spectrum efficient. Yeah, so in that way, 4G investments get replaced by 5G investments. But let me come to the world records. Maybe some of you remember, Tim, when you and I stood on stage and had this uh, round thing in our hands and we're announcing that we were the first to have a low latency of one millisecond. That was in 2016. 
the world record of one millisecond. Last year, we showed, we were actually the first to show that we can guarantee a latency of eight milliseconds, which you need for industrial applications. End of last year, we were the first operator in Europe who put real 5G antennas into our real mobile 4G network and made it work. So first operator in Europe, in Berlin, to have four real 5G antennas in a real network, and we repeated that in Austria. And now comes the new thing where we were first worldwide, because we were last week the first worldwide to actually show that components of different vendors can talk to each other. We call that operabil interoperability. Yeah? So we could do in our environment in Bonn, we connected 5G antennas of Huawei with a 5G new radio platform of Intel and the chip, and we made the mobile networks and the chips talk to each other. A and having different components talk to each other, and we're very proud to be the first uh, who did this in an operator environment, is a very, very important step towards 5G, towards f real 5G. Now, when you ask me, okay, when do we have it available? Um, we believe, or we see, we will have the first big, big commercial trials this year and have 5G fully live in by 2020. Now, talking about two use cases, which I mentioned, number one is what we call virtual fiber, the fixed wireless access. As I said, we believe it can complement access technologies to bring gigabit speed fast to those who do not want to dig up their garden. And this is why we are testing, and we will deploy with Huawei, with Ericsson, and Samsung fixed wireless access technologies. Here at the booth, you can actually see a project we did with regard to um, what we call virtual fiber with Facebook. Under the telecom infra um, project, and you can see it here, it's a solution which provides up to a gig very easily to the homes of people. And you can see here how it's actually working. By the way, one problem with these frequencies is that they get easily interrupted when a branch or a truck goes into the site. But we have solved this as well, because when that happens, the um, traffic gets automatically rerouted to other antennas. So here you can see the solution with Facebook. We will actually have a setup for that. And we will also bring and test this virtual fiber solution to Magia Telecom in Hungary. Coming now to a very interesting use case. Last year, we also used this term 5G for good, technology for good. And what we meant is that 5G should also help to solve a very specific problem. Now, I believe one of our biggest problems, not the only one, but for sure a very big problem, is what in Germany we call the Energiewende, the energy paradigm shift, the Energiewende. What does that mean? We want to move away from fossil fuels and nuclear power to renewable energies. And it also means that you need to move away from super central systems to systems which allow, for example, that in every street, in every house, you can charge an electrical vehicle, or to a system where from every house, you can feed energy into the system. Now, apropos electrical vehicles, it's not 5G, but you, what you can see here as well, uh, Deutsche Telekom has the street cabins where we have electricity, and we can actually build, in Germany alone, 12,500 12, charging stations using our street cabinets. 
But now coming back to the energy management. So the trick is that we can have systems that can manage very decentrally and bidirectionally, taking out energy, feeding in energy. And today's networks, low voltage networks, are too stupid. Today's low voltage networks are just too stupid, and we have a solution. And for that specific problem, 5G can help. Why? Because 5G has low latency, guaranteed low latency, it is high capacity and very, very high reliability to manage, to help manage such a decentral network of devices. And because this is the case, we will do a smart energy management pilot testbed in the city of Dresden Johannstadt. And we will start now with the 4G and then move to 5G in three steps. So we will actually see how Energiewende can be supported by 5G in the city of Dresden. And I have to say I'm very, very happy to have here Mr. Hilbert, who is the mayor of Dresden. So welcome here. Hello. <laughs> so we said before, Herr Hilbert, that our aspiration is to turn Dresden into the hotspot for Energiewende. Yeah. yeah, and that's the idea, together with 5G, to see how we can combine these things. So thanks for being Thank here. Thanks. So. so that is about um, 5G enabling smart energy. By the way, for those who are more interested in other industry sectors, we have here a rather fascinating healthcare use case for um, emergency care. So, I said we connect our customers to the opportunities today. So we connect drones, we connect bridges and railroads and screwdrivers and jackhammers, and we connect citizens to digital services. And we continue to be leading in making our networks 5G ready. And we do not only consider this as a technology project, but as a project which helps to solve topics of other industry sectors. And now I come to the topic of customer experience. And let me start with the smart speaker. Now, voiceification is, of course, one mega trend. Yeah, it's as important as was the PC uh, as was the mouse for the PC in the 80s. And this is now voice. And this is also why Deutsche Telekom um, will launch our smart speaker, Hello Magenta, this year. And what does it do? It allows voice control of the telecom services, like telephony, entertainment, or smart home. And for our own services, it does it with a better customer experience. We will also integrate services of partners, for example, banks, retailers, and insurance companies. And it's uh, made sure that this voice hub is consistent with the uh, European um, data protection laws. Now, I should say we do not mean to, in this way, to compete against the Alexis. We see it complementary. Yeah? We want to give customers a choice yeah? to choose even on one device between Alexa functionalities or telecom functionalities. Yeah? And switch off if the customer wants the Alexa functionalities and switch on the telecom functionalities. So it's an alternative if you want to have a great user experience for the typical entertainment or telecommunication services. That's the speaker. Last year, we also had this year. This is where, where Tim was standing on the stage. I see you in a very strange manner. I have to say I need to put it off, otherwise I get dizzy. So last year, Tim announced the joint venture with Zeiss, which in the meantime was founded, Company Tools Technologies. It's a 50% joint venture with the optical giant Zeiss. And the purpose is to develop technologies 
that make it possible to integrate content, virtual reality or augmented reality content on a glass, on a normal glass, in a very convenient way, yeah, so that it doesn't bother you. It's shown here at the side of the glass. Um, one practical application, my husband is a surgeon, for example, and he said this would be a super tool for surgeons um, because the World Health Organization says you need to wear glasses as a surgeon anyhow. And the reason why accidents happen is that surgeons don't have their checklist. So, which says what has been done with the patient and who is the patient and what's the blood graph, etc. So you can actually have that played into the glass. So we will, together with SAIS, work on this joint venture and also make sure that we get a good customer experience about glasses that feel naturally. By the way, I should say you can see at this booth a lot of super interesting use cases Yesterday, I tried to play against Manuel Neuer, tried to do a goal, but I failed. You can do it over there. But just imagine you don't have that with the big and heavy glasses, but with light glasses. Yeah, it's a really different customer experience. So, now we come, I come to the last thing, my favorite one. And I need to show it here. So what is this? This is an antenna. An antenna. An antenna which gets put below the body of an aircraft. And that antenna receives signals from the ground, LTE signals from the ground. And you might remember that two years ago we said we are going to build Europe's first and only, Europe's first and only LTE aviation network. And I'm really, really proud of our technology team that we did it. Europe's first and only aviation network. It has an antenna this size. We built 292 antennas in 30 European countries. These antennas beam up to an altitude of 12 kilometers and a speed of 1,000 kilometers per hour to send the signals to these antennas. And you know what the good thing is? Today's satellite solutions require that a satellite that size, minimum 100 kilos, needs to be put on the aircraft, which is not so super aerodynamic and for sure not energy efficient. And the other advantage is that with this antenna, plus our 292 LTE stations on the ground, which are, by the way, combined with an Imasat satellite capacity, you can get a speed of 75 megabit per second into the cabin. But it's not only about the speed. Another cool thing is that the latency, the reaction time of the network is just 100 milliseconds. Yeah, in a satellite, it's 10 times as much, and very practically that means if from now onwards you are sitting in a cabin and you use the Deutsche Telekom solution and you do a call, it's the same feeling as if you were calling from home. On the flight, the same feeling as if you were calling from home because of the low latency compared to the satellite solutions. So we are actually very proud that we have it now available and look forward to bringing it, Tim, on board of the aircraft. Now I have to pause. You might have realized that in Deutsche Telekom, the woman, the first lady, talks all about technology. Tim is sitting here. We have a super division of labor. Tim is going to talk about his pet topic, soccer, and I have therefore a surprise for him. And Tim, I need to invite you to come now up on stage for some surprise. So thank you. So first, I'd like to welcome everybody here at the booth of Magenta Deutsche Telekom. And uh, I have to say, you know, I'm very proud of what Claudia presented of today. So give her a hand. I think she did a great job so far here. So now, I, I think what we can be proud of is that we have 
you know, committed to a lot of things over the last years. And if you check them out, you know, we have almost to all the topics, we have found answers and really products which we have showed already today. These are not only subjects which are coming, let's say, in the next decade. Most of the stuff is here already. And we launched the European Aviation Network. You know, people were really questioning, what the heck are you doing? A Europe-wide network for all the aircrafts. And by the way, um, we are talking about hundreds of aircrafts who are flying, you know, just this minute over Europe and not being connected to the, to the Internet. Think about the productive time you can have. Think about the entertaining which you have. But as I said, Claudia is talking about the technology. I'm talking about spots. And you know, I like to talk about a man you might have heard about. He won the triple. He's in one of my favorite teams, uh, which has a T on the shirt. He has been awarded four times the best footballer as the best world goalkeeper in the world. Who is the guy? Here we go. It's our number one in the goal of Germany, Manuel Neuer. And you know what? Is he here? No. Manuel Neuer, he is on a plane. And therefore, you know, what we are doing right now, we are now using the European Aviation Network of Deutsche Telekom to just get connected with the best footballer of Germany. So, Manuel, where are you? Yeah, hello, I'm here above. So, Manuel, how does it look down there for you? Very good. I think that the connection steht und äh, dass es gut funktioniert. Ich habe jetzt die ganze Vorbereitung und auch äh, ja, die Vorstellung von mir, habe ich alle mitbekommen und äh, ja, war sehr interessant und äh, ich glaube, die Verbindung ist super. Hast du ein Problem damit, das Flugzeug hat nicht mehr genug Sprit, weil die Claudia so lange geredet hat, musst du leider im Fallschirm jetzt gleich aussteigen. Ja, aber ich muss ganz ehrlich sagen, unten äh, haben wir, glaube ich, minus 10 Grad und hier oben, äh, der Flieger ist beheizt und ich fühle mich sehr wohl. Kannst du mal ein bisschen rumzeigen mit deiner Kamera? Du benutzt ja ein normales Smartphone, was so um dich herum ist. Okay. Einen Augenblick. So, wir schauen jetzt erstmal raus. Da sieht man, dass wir hier in der Luft sind. Ich zeige Ihnen noch, wer hier im Flieger sitzt. Ganz genau da vorne im Cockpit die Piloten, unsere Crew. Und hier ist der Ammer. Er hat mir die Einweisung erteilt. So, aber das funktioniert ja eigentlich ganz gut. Ihr seht uns auch ganz gut hier in Barcelona. Ich sehe gerade, ihr fliegt gerade in Richtung Frankfurt am Main, der kommt aus München. So, ähm, wenn ich jetzt mal über die Innovationen nachdenke, die du in den letzten Jahren so alle genutzt hast, und ich denke mal, du bist ja auch ein echter Tech-Freak hier. Was würdest du sagen, was war die Innovation, die dich am meisten beeindruckt hat? Ich denke grundsätzlich, dass sich das Mobiltelefon weiterentwickelt hat, die Verbindung zum Internet. Und äh, dass ich auch ein bisschen stolz darauf bin, dass ich diese neue Innovation jetzt kennenlernen darf. Ja. Ich glaube mal, das Smartphone ist schon äh, Teufelszeug gewesen, wenn man mal sich überlegt, was wir da entsprechend ähm, im So, wir haben jetzt hier ganz, ganz viele Menschen sitzen im Raum, die sich alle fragen, äh, wie es dir denn eigentlich so geht. Also, ähm, die Weltmeisterschaft kommt, ähm, wir brauchen den besten Mann ganz vorne uns im Tor hier. Also, wie geht's dir? Ja, vielen Dank. Äh, ich denke, dass der Weltmeisterschaft nicht im Wege steht. Ich bin auf einem guten Weg in der Rehabilitation und habe auch trainiert und äh, war beim Physiotherapeuten und bin deshalb äh, ja, für den heutigen Tag schon mit dem Training durch. Und wie sieht das aus? Hast du die Prognose? Wird das alles was werden? Ja, klar. Also ich bin zuversichtlich, dass ich äh, wieder bei der Weltmeisterschaft im Tor stehe und ich hoffe, dass ich auch noch äh, ein paar Rückrundenspiele mache für den FC Bayern München und äh, ich habe noch sehr viele Spiele mit dem FC Bayern und äh, auch mit der Nationalmannschaft. Also wir drücken dir alle Daumen hier, dass das was wird und ähm, vielleicht noch ein letzter Satz zu unserem europäischen Netzwerk. Was, was denkst du über diese Innovation? Ist das Spielkram? Ist das relevant? Wäre das was, was du auch benutzen würdest, wenn du im Flugzeug unterwegs bist? Du bist ja viel unterwegs. Ja klar, ich denke, ähm, dass wir natürlich international auch unterwegs sind und äh, gerade in der Champions League es ist ja auch so, dass man schon mal in Barcelona spielen kann und äh, dann kann ich mit dem ehemaligen Mitspieler Ivan Rakitic zum Beispiel ähm, nach dem Spiel noch mal kurz darüber sprechen, wie wir äh, gespielt haben. 
So, ich finde, das ist doch eine super Diskussion, die wir hier führen können. Alles online, derzeit live. Manuel, alles Gute dir fürs Training, alles Gute für die nächste Saison. Wir zählen auf dich und die Telekom bleibt treuer Sponsor, dass auch dein Gehalt in der Zukunft immer gesichert ist bei Bayern München. Also in diesem Sinn, alles Gute. Danke dir für die Mitarbeit hier. So, I think uh, I can tell you, um, there were a lot of technicians who were close to a heart attack. I think they get a great job in the plane, but even, you know, on the booth. This was real life um, um, together with uh, uh, our airplanes. So the network is ready, guys. Um, the network is across the entire footprint of Europe available. It will be interlinked with satellites in areas where we don't have a coverage, like in the Alps or something like that. Now it's time of the aircraft and the, uh, the airline industry you know, to, to use this um, service. And then uh, I think the last white spot, um, which wasn't covered yet, is then available for mobile services. So here we are, Claudia, giving back to you. Yes, thank you. So I hope you could see how real it works, right? So and I must say, and uh, here to the entire team, a big thank you. Yeah, And I guess now, Philip, you are coming here because yes. we go now into the exactly. Q&A. We go right? into the question and answer session. Tim, why Need just to come back? you don't so you come back? stay with us. Danika and Sabrina are here with a microphone. It is going to be a bit challenging. <laughs> so if you raise your hand, if you've got questions, yeah. um, let's start in the front I'm here, fine. in the middle, and then we work upwards. Please. <coughs> can we? Hello. Can you yes, hear me? Yes. No, it's working. Where? I'm here. <laughs> Where? Ah, First row. Down here. Front here. <laughs> I'm Roxana Ona for, uh, from Mobile Communications Magazine Romania. Do you think Europe is ready for 5G? Because the CEO of uh, Ericsson and Nokia stated that US and uh, Asia will be in front of Euro. So. I would say it depends on what use uh, case area you look at. Uh, United States is very much uh, ahead on the fixed wireless access, which I mentioned as well, and Asia on consumer, right? Because it's uh, somehow a very uh, playful society. I believe what we will see in Europe is really a combination of industrial use cases, specific in automotive and energy, plus fixed wireless access as complement, and we will also see a capacity upgrade. Having said that, though, it will be important in all our countries, and also Romania, that the uh, spectrum auction stim are decent, right? So that nobody has the idea that the auction uh, is meant to fill money into the uh, financial deficit of the state, but really make sure that we can get the spectrum, and then we have meaningful uh, requests how we actually build it up. In terms of ARPU, ARPU is very low in Europe compared with, with uh, America and Asia. And uh, Nokia or Ericsson is not uh, a healthcare organization. They want to invest in a rich country, not in poor countries. <laughs> Look, the first thing is definitely um, relevant that, you know, we have decent revenues on 5G as well, because the revenues create um, um, a profit and the profits create cash flow which we then could reinvest into the infrastructure. I think, you know, we have a, in the mobile area, we have a, um, um, a healthy system across Europe. Um, so we are able to invest into the infrastructure. When it comes to the technical capabilities, I think we are ready to go. Um, the German engineers, for instance, Deutsche Telekom, and even, you know, our European footprint people are very well educated. They're ahead of uh, what's going on. So we are not behind the Asian or the Americans in this regard. So we are ready to build this infrastructure. But you know, as Claudia said, uh, we need the regulatory setup for uh, this industry, which requires spectrum. And I can only take you, we are talking about 3.x spectrum, which is coming. We should immediately start there after going into, you know, a spectrum beyond 6 gigahertz, 26 gigahertz, and other uh, spectrum bands. So we need much more spectrum than what is foreseen yet. And second, I hope that we get less regulation um, in the mobile space and not more regulation. So um, ideas like, you know, um, uh, mobile wholesale uh, access or national roaming uh, ideas, I think this would be contraproductive um, for the build out of uh, 5G in our uh, environment. 
Okay, there's a question on the right side, and then we go over to the left side. Um, Ina Grabas from Handelsblatt. I've got one question concerning your smart speaker. Um, you said it's not a competition with, it's not going to go in competition with Alexa. It's more complimentary. I'm not quite sure how that's going to look like. See, you have different uh, use cases. Uh, you have what we have with a good customer experience is that you can use, if you have it, our TV and entertainment product, you can uh, switch on smart home with this. You can say, call my mom. And these services, the telecommunication services, work in German language with a, a better customer experience. In addition, you could, of course, also use the Amazon retail services and the services which Amazon Amazon had on principle on a same device whereas a consumer you can choose whether you want to activate only the telecom services or in addition also to activate for example the Amazon Alexa services and therefore I see it complementary um, maybe I should add one thing which I didn't say in the speech we have Tim a lot of discussions with banks and insurance companies and retailers and um, also together with our friends here at Orange, because we built that solution jointly. And what is very important is that the companies are telling us that they are really interested in a European alternative. For example, if you want to do per voice a bank transaction, yeah, under the current circumstances, you cannot do it when it runs via a server in the United States. But on a model, which will work technically like our one, you could on principle do it. Yeah, so that is what I mean, complementary use cases. Good, a question here on the left side and we, we go to the middle. Hello, right here. Adrian Sercelanu from Romania, two short questions. Next month there are going to be 10 years since you invested in Greek OTE. If you could share with us some ideas, some comments on uh, the performance so far and how about the future. And the second question, Please. Greek Ote, uh, ten, in ten years since, since you invested first time, uh, you bought shares. And the second question, we've seen your strong opinion about uh, um, Vodafone and the Liberty Global uh, transaction in Germany. What do you think about the potential deal in Hungary and Romania? Thank you. Look, the, the first question is, um, our Greek friends, um, we are very, very proud to have this group of people and this company with us. You know, they started, you know, in very difficult times. It was just after 2008, you know, with all the turmoil in the market and especially with the Greek economy suffering big time. Since that time, the company has massively restructured. The company has massively um, reduced their indebtedness. Um, and the company has been quite innovative in the way how they are working on convergence, how they're working on mobile services. They adapted very much to the DNA of Deutsche Telekom you know, leading in network. This is, let's say, our major DNA that we always want to win the net test. We always want to have the best mobile service, and you know we have that in most of the markets, including Greece. And on top of that, we are investing now heavily in <coughs> fixed line, so in the fast internet connection. That is um, the, the, the part where we are right now. So um, we are very happy uh, with uh, the development of, of OT, um, and the way how, how the team is, is driving that. And, um, um, you know, perspectively, you know, our relationship is might even, you know, um, uh, come, come even tighter uh, in the way how we are cooperating in an international footprint. Now, my question around um, Liberty Global um, and uh, the, the potential uh, combination with Vodafone. The first one, it's, you know, just a speculation in the market. So uh, I do not know more than you know. Um, uh, it is affecting big time the German market. And I think from the history of where we are coming from, this deal is unacceptable. Remember, we started that deal um, by um, selling the cable infrastructure in the 2000s, beginning of 2000s. At that time, we were not able, as Deutsche Telekom, to sell cable uh, in one piece. We have to put it in three pieces because the antitrust authority said, they do not want to have a cable market dominance. So if now Liberty Global and Vodafone would come together, they would create a monopoly in the cable market, which was not the intention from the beginning. The second thing, it is creating a monopoly in the housing associations. 25 to 30% of housing associations 
only have access to this cable provider. The third one is the dominance in the TV market combined with the telecommunication provider is something I personally find very tricky for democracy and find very tricky, let's say, for, uh, for societal aspects. So this high concentration on the TV market, which this company would have, is even something where I think uh, this is struggling. So my perspective is this deal is very um, unlikely to get approval. I find it from a competitive perspective uh, unacceptable. Okay, uh, gentlemen in the middle, then we go to the lady on my left side, and then we come to the right side. Uh, Dimitris Malas from CNN Greece. Uh, now, the colleague gave me a pass for to, an assist, as you can call it. Are you going to be interested in for the 5% of OTE that is uh, put up on sale from the Greek state? And second question, a third one, if you can give us any hint about which are the countries that you're going to launch the big commercial uh, tests about uh, 5G that you, Claudia said about? Yes, I, I start with the uh, last question. Actually, uh, we will do big commercial tests for sure in all our big integrated countries. And then it's a question of timing. So we will, do, we will start with Germany. We have done a lot in uh, Hungary and um, as I see Srini here also in Slovakia. Um, Greece will also follow. I think it's from a timing perspective right now a little bit behind uh, the development in Germany, but we will for sure yeah, do it in all of our important countries as well. But very, very on a short term notice, it's more on starting with Germany and Hungary and Slovakia. The answer on the 5%, look, it's not here the forum to discuss, you know, shareholding and shareholder issues. Um, so therefore, you know, um, when we have the topic um, uh, and the uh, circumstances, the, the, the premises lying on the table, we then will consider, you know, whether this 5% might be interesting for us. Good. We have the lady over here on my left and then we go to the right to Thomas. Hi, Kate Ferguson from Deutsche Welle. You mentioned uh, the spectrum auction and also the idea of regulation. I'm wondering to what extent Germany's long delay forming a government is hampering progress on 5G. Look, um, I, I hope we get a government soon and I get, you know, all the, um, uh, the people in charge um, 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 for, for making the right decisions. Um, I think there was no standstill. Uh, political bodies were working on the auction process for the th uh, three-point X spectrum. So I do not experience a delay on this subject. So it's coming throughout this year, and that was always the plan. So um, uh, we are quite optimistic that we could stick to the time plans which we have in mind. So Thomas is next, and then we move on to Henning. If you have questions, please raise your hand that we can provide you a microphone. Thomas Holzert from the German newspaper Die Welt. You were talking about 12,500 charging stations on your cabinets. Um, do you have a timetable for that and do you have a business model for that? Look, first I think that is a really cool innovation. Claudia, I haven't had the time really to go in deep to this one today because we have so many stuff to talk about. But the idea what we had, what said, how can we support the societal issue of that how can we move into immobility when we have no loading or tanking stations in Germany? Um, and therefore, we thought, do we have a contribution on that one? And the idea was that we have 380,000 of our street cabinets in Germany. 380,000. Now, not every of the street cabinets qualifies for becoming um, an e-loading station. Why is that? Because some of them are at the side of the pedestrian and not at the side of the street. Some of them don't have a parking lot close to it. So therefore, we were qualifying now 12,000 street cabinets immediately. And on top of that, we get in all cities, we get um, fast loading stations. Because here, we can use uh, the switch houses, our switch houses, where we have the right power supply today. There's a huge benefit that Deutsche Telekom is contributing there because first, all of the street cabinets are, let's say, um, regulatory-wise already approved. Second, they all have a power supply and a metering system. Thirdly, we could easily help to uh, enable online service to use this um, uh, loading station. And last but not least, in the cities, we have even parking lots 
um, which are very close to the, uh, to the power supply for the fast uh, loading stations. Now we will now start immediately, or we have started already, um, to do this. Um, this will be a couple of hundreds by the course of this year. We are applying for governmental money on this subject uh, because you know there's a big fund uh, being available to accelerate um, uh, the immobility in, 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 in Germany and we are applying for this money. The moment we get biggest support on that one and we learn how this is working even in the energy supply in the cities, that moment we could easily accelerate that model up to 12,000 and even beyond that. That means everywhere, not only in the center cities, even in the rural areas where people are living, we will be able to install um, these uh, loading stations. Okay, Henning Geig is next, and then we go to Thomas Kuhn and come back to the right side. Okay, okay thank yeah. you. Henning Geig from Teltarif DE Germany. We have learned that 5G is on the portal starting soon, 4G is running well. What are your plans on the future of 2G and 3G? Some network operators uh, are intending to switch it off. What will you do? Yeah. So on principle, uh, and it depends on what spectrum we get, but we shuffle spectrum, we switch spectrum, and the faster we can get to the uh, higher Gs, the better it is for us. Yeah, so we have, uh, for, for instance, the uh, 15 megahertz uh, I was talking about on the, uh, N uh, on the 900 band was also from uh, reshuffling it. So we move stuff towards LTE and um, to the 5G. Network. Look, in the US, we have almost moved all 2G yeah. and 3G spectrum already in 4G. We are deploying a full LTE network, including voice based on Volte, and the customer experience is outstanding. So this is our experience in the US. And we are now trying to freeze up the, all the spectrum which we have to the 3G and move it into the 4G spectrum uh, uh, as well. That will give us more bandwidth and at the same time it will reduce complexity big time. So that is definitely um, a target for our engineering team. Okay. Thomas, Thomas Kuhn of Wirtschaftswoche, hi. Um, you were speaking about charging of cars. I'm up here. I see you. We yeah. see you. Um, you spoke of charging of cars, but in the future of mobile mobility that is more and more driven by auto autonomous driving, there would be a chance for a network operator such as Deutsche Telekom not only to charge the cars, but to guide them to traffic, which would be an opportunity to for, for you to pro either provide the services or pro um, make money um, bringing people faster or more secure to other spaces. Is that something you consider? So um, I, I hope that what I said about uh, air traffic management in the air and about traffic management in the energy network shows that we are actually willing to, to get into the discussion which type of networks we can contribute together with partners to manage. Yeah, and we learn a lot here in the collaboration with the Deutsche Flugsicherung, or we will learn a lot yeah, together with the uh, company here in, in Dresden um, and others where we're doing it. But on principle, getting more into what you call traffic type of management and uh, leveraging cooperation with other partners is something which, which I think could be a potential step. But, but, but rather, in automotive partners or other types of partners? So, so actually, I believe, uh, like here, in collaboration with energy partners, strongly in collaboration also with automotive partners. Yeah? And then we need to see who, uh, what other technology providers we would actually need to complement that. Look, this specific case, to be honest, is not something where we have a kind of execution mode or something on it. That's more than a strategic planning question and a kind of portfolio decision which we have to take. I think what, what we are doing these days is more thinking about component and solution business. In the past, there was a SIM card coming with connectivity. And in the future world, being it on narrowband IoT or being it in 5G, we will not sell only a mobile service. We will even or maybe only sell a solution. That means, for instance, you know, if you take narrowband IoT, uh, you know, we are not selling cards into smart parking. We are getting a revenue share of the parking uh, um, uh, uh, fees um, which being collected. And this is then the question. In the future, there might be chipsets built into 
devices in cars or in computers or robots and we will provide to this chipset connectivity and you buy a license fee or something around it so it will be more a component um, of a solution um, than rather just the old way of selling connectivity. Okay, we have two more questions left and then we have uh, to end. The gentleman on the right, yes, please. Hi, I'm Alan Burkett Gray from Capacity and GTB. How disappointed are you that the second attempt to merge T-Mobile US with Sprint failed at what's a crucial investment cycle in the industry? And a couple of years after you became the biggest shareholder in BT when you sold, you and uh, Orange sold them EE, um, at that time, saying to people privately that you wanted to make a bid for BT when you can. It's a lot cheaper now after our stupid decision two years ago. Um, are you still interested? So my friend, you missed the press conference last week, you know. We had the mobile work congress today and therefore, you know, I should not talk about Sprint or, you know, any kind of American, you know, M&A stuff or should talk about the BT. But, you know, to satisfy my customers here the best way, um, in the US everything has been said on this deal. Um, and therefore, um, I was always a big fan of the, um, of the opportunity of creating really a joint powerhouse, which might then challenge horizon going forward. It would have created, you know, huge synergies, and at the same time, it would have enabled us, um, you know, with the spectrum to really challenge establishment. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and therefore, that would, would be definitely something of uh, added value for our customers. Now, um, you only need to dance and therefore you know at that point in time you know it wasn't time for dancing so um, but I was a big fan of that deal um, nothing new to say on that one the second thing on BT um, look um, it was very difficult to predict brexit you know um, it was very difficult to predict then yet the pound was losing so much money it was very difficult to predict you know even the behavior of the regulator who was quite tough in the UK on BT um, but what I am saying is, strategically, we believe in fixed mobile convergent margins. We believe in the power of integration, the, the different technical bearers, and providing best data connectivity to our customers, whether they are on the home or on the move. And therefore, you know, if I look to the competition, which we have in the UK, they are somewhat fixed, they are somewhat mobile, but none of them is really offering a convergence customer experience which BT can, on top of that, they have great content rights. So we are very well convinced that from a strategic perspective, BT is very well positioned, knowing that they went to very turbulent times over the last two years. Okay, the last question is the gentleman with the beard in the mid. Uh, my name is Nicolas Larocco from Computer Based Germany. Can you clarify whether or not we're gonna see a 5G offering for the end consumer's uh, smartphone? or if it's just gonna be fixed wireless access in 2020? No, no, of course, uh, you will see uh, also 5G for 5G smartphones uh, for consumers. Okay, then thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for coming. I thank would you like very much to for coming, thank you. guys. I would like to invite you uh, to say a moment with us because at the booth all the topics we were discussing about and many others are here at our booth so please uh, refer yourself uh, <laughs> to the uh, to, to the colleagues here and they are happy to explain you more things uh, that we display here at the mobile world congress and after that then i wish you a successful trade show here in barcelona thanks for coming have a, have a great day bye bye <laughs>